start recording really quickly. Cool. So, hey guys, uh, welcome to Peak's fifth panel in our Leadership and Service series. Today we're joined by two phenomenal speakers, um, both coming from UT Austin um, and also in Austin right now. So, um, a little bit about Peak before you know we get started with introductions and questions. Um, Peak is a Houston-based nonprofit that has 15 chapters across six cities uh, with the goal of engaging youth in their local communities through civic engagement. And we want youth like yourselves to involve as early as possible in solving community issues. So as you grow older, um, you know, you have the confidence uh, as well as the experience to deal with issues that you know, are more pertaining to um, you know, everyone as a whole. So we can go ahead and get started with introductions here. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce Miss Ashley Jennings. Ashley Jennings is an award-winning producer, two-time startup founder in diversity and tech evangelists. She serves as program director of innovation and technology, uh, commercialization, and managing director of the Texas Innovation Center, where she helps oversee uni university-wide commercialization efforts for faculty and students in translation research. Through her work in the startup ecosystem, She's been deemed a top connector of people and organizations in Austin, focused on real change around systemic problems for women in the workforce and gender inequality. Ashley helped co-found and served as chief marketing officer for, for Texas's first tech accelerator for women and ethnically diverse tech founders aimed at increasing diversity in the tech industry. She also co-owned a video production agency as executive producer, championing content for clients of all sizes from local startups to Fortune 100 companies. Our second speaker is Leslie Robinson. Leslie Robinson is passionate about empowering students, especially women, to find the best path to their own destination and absolutely believes in taking the world by the horns. Robinson brings a mix of experience in higher education, nonprofit management, and corporate partnerships with a proven record of supporting students and early stage entrepreneurs to have innovative experiences with impact embedded. Currently, Leslie is the inaugural program manager for the newly launched Kendra Scott Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. The Well Institute supports a curricular and co-curricular effort to provide students with promising college to career pathways, especially women and creatives who have been underrepresented in entrepreneurial roles. So a big thank you to Miss, or sorry, Leslie and Miss Jennings um, we can go ahead and get started with our questions for today. Awesome. So can we go ahead and get started um, with you guys sharing a little bit more about your industry um, and, you, and, you know, the kind of responsibilities, uh, you know, of your job? Ashley, go for it. Okay, great. <laughs> well, and I think something that's really uh, unique is that both Leslie and I, met in the startup ecosystem. And so coming from uh, that entrepreneurial environment here in Austin, I think has led us to this really goal and mission oriented uh, campus and, and the roles that we serve right now on campus. So hi everyone, Ashley Jennings. And I, as mentioned, I serve as managing director of the Texas Innovation Center. Um, the Texas Innovation Center at the University of Texas is a collaboration between the College of Natural Sciences Cockrell School of Engineering and the Office of Technology Commercialization. And we are a co-working space on campus focused on taking research and ideas out of labs or um, within the ecosystem and bringing them to market. So even though we're focused on STEM-based deep technologies, we serve students and faculty across campus. Um, and so to explain a little bit about what that means, translational research and um, the industry that I work in. So every public research university in the country has a tech transfer office. And when um, a discovery is made within a laboratory, uh, that faculty member or grad student or postdoc goes and files an invention disclosure. And once they file that invention disclosure to protect the intellectual property, they can go one of three ways. They either go and license the IP, um, they continue on with their research in the lab and can, uh, through sponsored research opportunities, or they come over into the section that I sit in, which is new venture creation and commercialization. And um, so to give a kind of a, 
an example of that, if you think of like Florida and Gatorade and the Gatorade fund that sits at Florida State and um, that being created inside of a lab, uh, Honeycrisp Apples was created at Minnesota, Google was created at Stanford. Um, so I have the opportunity and the privilege to help find what one of our University of Texas unicorns is going to look like. And um, right now we have incredible companies um, coming through the space, everything from robotics and AI to uh, proteins being utilized um, within different biological labs um, to we have a company out of geosciences that's a um, paleontologist solving board game that is funded by the NSF and now every Smithsonian in the country wants it. So we have this very wide array of companies that we work on but the Texas Innovation Center itself is really focused on three big value props. So one, we have um, a co-working space on campus, um, which is where I'm sitting now. And we hope to see you all back there for those of our Longhorns in the audience back there one day. Um, and so the co-working space itself serves as an environment where researchers and scientists and even undergraduates can come and be together in community and, and work on the innovative uh, ideas they have or the problems they're trying to solve. So co-working space is one of our big value props. Um, we also have something called Startup in a Box. And basically, if you come into the Texas Innovation Center and you're wanting to incorporate your company, um, we have uh, people who will help you incorporate, IP attorneys who will sit with you, accountants, HR, manufacturers, if you're prototyping something. We have a Longhorn friendly vendor list who we call upon um, in our startup in a box model to kind of get you the nuts and bolts of starting your company um, and whatever you're working on. And then our third big uh, value prop at the center is that we have a Friends of Texas Innovation Center network. And this is a network of incredible experts in different industries who come in and mentor and host office hours. We had an immigration and nationalization attorney in this week to help some of our grad students and postdocs um, navigate recent policy decisions. We have firms who specifically invest in university research come in from Boston and San Diego and New York. And then of course, we have a ton of firms here in Austin who are interested in what we're working on and, and what our faculty and grad students and postdocs are doing in the labs. And so that um, Longhorn uh, friend of Texas Innovation Center Network is something that we love, I love helping students tap into uh, with whatever you're working on. And um, so that's a little bit about what I do um, at the Texas Innovation Center and kind of what our overall mission and, and vision is. Awesome, well, thank you for sharing, Ms. Jennings. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important to kind of touch again on how you talked about how, you know, Google was started at Stanford um, and, you know, and Gatorade had its origins um, in Florida. And I think, you know, that just says that college students have the, you know, potential to, you know, make changes and come up with these big, bold ideas that really do make differences in society. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for kind of serving as a supporting structure for everyone trying to do something in entrepreneurship. Um, so can we have, um, you know, Leslie share a little bit more about, um, you know, your industry as well as your job? Yeah, absolutely. Ashley, you're so awesome. I, I always so amazed at like everything you've done, but especially like the, the imprint that you have at UT and the support system. It's really incredible. And um, thank you so much, Pete, for having me. I'm so excited to, to share um, not only kind of just about women in entrepreneurship, but especially, you know, to blast out and launch and amplify what we're doing here with the Kendra Scott Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Institute, or what we call the Well Institute for short. Um, just quickly, a little bit of background about me is just as we tell our startups and our founders to pivot, you know, so much of this has been a career pivot for me and just not naturally um, an entrepreneur or have had like startups in my background or in my experience. In fact, uh, my background is very much in higher education and specifically in international education. So I worked at University of Tulsa, Princeton University, St. Edwards, and now UT in international education. But if you think about that and just my love to encourage students to take on the world as their classroom and to get uncomfortable, it's very much entrepreneurial in that you are figuring it out as you go, um, surrounded by new sights and sounds and smells and tastes and iterating and having that entrepreneurial mindset and that confidence to go out on your own and experience the world. So um, so it's, it, it seems also a little natural to end up supporting 
founders to, to go on that journey and to give them the tools and the resources to do that. So specifically in the Well Institute, we obviously are centered around empowering women to lead and encouraging the world to follow. And that's, you know, looks like building confidence and building community and equipping students to to either start or just have the leadership skills to know how to run businesses and to have, you know, the entrepreneurial mindset to to throw things on the wall and stick, but also we want to celebrate and represent our female founders and to have that community um, and have that community be so strong, especially as students graduate and, you know, seek out what it is that they want to be or, you know, continue to become once they leave the 40 acres or wherever they are. And the other thing that I'll mention about the Well Institute is we are unique in that we're interdisciplinary and we're not attached to any college or um, on campus at UT. We have McCombs, the College of Fine Arts, and also UGS undergraduate studies that um, have been kind of the founding colleges. But what, what that means is that we can very much be an institute for students and by students. And so a lot of the things that we are launching out with this fall semester are going to be student run, student led, so that our, our females that are engaging with the institute are, are, are doing the things and building the leadership skills with the institute as their, their voice and their platform to do that. So the institute was actually just announced and launched in September 2019. And then we do have courses that we sponsored. So there are courses that you can take that are um, tracked for the Well Institute. And then very much we do programming and workshops and share the resources across campus to be that central hub for female founders. And if you look at the background of my Zoom, it's a space that is actually um, in the works to be created. Renovation began on Monday and we're so excited to have this physical space on campus and Doty Fine Arts, which will be the lobby of that building for um, students to come and convene and have community and think creatively about, you know, passion projects that then can, you know, turn into enterprises or ventures of their own. And so come check it out. I don't know what the fall looks like, but it's slated to be open at the end of September. And very much we are looking for, you know, students to create the culture of the space and truly have it be inclusive and empowering. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, um, Leslie. And I just want to, you know, before we continue, just say thank you in general for, you know, kind of carrying out the mission of the Wall Institute. Um, you know, I don't think there could be enough importance placed on, you know, supporting women in entrepreneurship. Um, and, I, and both of you guys have been, you know, very big advocates of, you know, creating gender equality and making sure that women are supported. Um, and before we continue on to our next question, I just want to echo, you know, what you said about the importance of the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and, you know, and just don't be afraid to fail and just keep trying until something works. Um, and, you know, and that's how real progress is created. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and, you know, this is a little more relevant to, you know, what's going on around us. And, you know, things are changing day to day, um, even hour by hour. And we are curious to learn um, as youth, how has the pandemic changed, you know, the landscape that you guys work in, um, as well as the needs of your industry moving forward? Well, I think it, every industry has changed because of this. And specifically uh, where we sit in academia and education overall has changed uh, and it will never be the same. Uh, what we're, the current crisis we're in is probably potentially the worst global crisis we've seen since World War II. And so not only, you know, the econo economic and health impact that we've seen, but just every industry that's being shaken up right now by this pandemic and specifically, so, I mean, to talking to the two that I kind of sit in, um, on the academic side, we're really having to uh, think innovatively about um, how we're going to open in the fall um, and figuring out, uh, you know, how we're going to implement online learning and programmatically figuring out how to make sure that we're able to hold some of this important programming, um, but engage the audiences we need. Um, and so in terms of the Texas Innovation Center, um, I like to take it back to March. We were supposed to launch this new space that you see behind me. Um, on March 31st was our open house. We had uh, a few weeks before just had 
this really incredible event where 12 of our startup companies pitched to the Central Texas Angel Network one evening and it was an awesome event where our companies got to share their technologies and gather feedback and ask for support. And so that was the pre-launch to our overall open house, which was gonna be for everyone across campus and community to come in. And um, it's almost as if I'm sure everyone has felt this way. It's, it was like almost a soap opera script what happened at the university. First we, um, you know, our provost left and then our president announced that he was leaving. And then on top of that, our research labs were shut down as the university shut down completely. And so when our research lab shut down, that meant that most of our portfolio over at the Texas Innovation Center halted um, because our companies relied on different efficacy testing that they were doing, various metrics and milestones they were trying to hit for the next round of funding for uh, grants that they were on. And um, so we were pivoted, my executive director and I, to COVID-19 response projects. And first I was working um, on N95 masks uh, with the Texas Military Department's Innovation Task Force. And we were trying to figure out um, how to, at the moment, a lot of various um, 3D printing companies were stepping in and taking the source code that was open source for these masks and wanting to print out tons of masks to be able for the governor's task force to deploy across Texas, but we were wanting to make sure that those masks were going to be properly tested first before a lot of these startup companies, uh, 3D printing companies were going to be uh, manufacturing them and, and deploying them. So first I was on N95 masks and then we were pivoted to um, bridge, a bridge ventilator that was a partnership between some of our incredible faculty out of Cockrell School of Engineering and some of our uh, doctors out of Del Med. And so we were helping on uh, the creation of what that bridge ventilator would look like. And that's where my executive director still sits right now. It's currently uh, going through emergency FDA regulatory pathway and uh, about to be in the hands of a manufacturer, which is really exciting because those will be deployed out to rural areas across Texas. But I was finally put on a world that I never thought I'd be put into, which was um, epidemiological forecasting and modeling of the virus. And so um, we kind of divided and conquered. Van and I, my uh, executive director, um, were a lean mean startup team over at the Texas Innovation Center. And being a former entrepreneur myself, um, agilely being able to pivot quickly in a time of crisis is something that you learn uh, through the sweat, blood, and tears that go into starting any company and having or, or pivoting any career. And so we very quickly were pivoted into those projects and um, I became the chief of staff and project manager for a scientist who was overseeing a 50 to 60 person consortium every morning. And it was almost something out of a command center call, if you will, where every morning at 9 a.m. I was logging on and it was a room full of mathematicians and data scientists and some of the most incredibly trained um, data trackers of our time and um, I sat in a 500 foot view of really overseeing the scientists and the projects that were going on to make sure that they could focus on the science and they were at the 50 foot view of, of making sure that they were delivering whether it was on um, we were reporting directly to uh, the city of Austin and she would go up in front of the governor's task force and then at times the White House subcommittee on science technology and space so just a fascinating world that I never thought I would sit in, but I was pivoted to this project out of need and out of current time of crisis. And as an innovator, um, I think these times and this, how this pandemic has changed overall is that innovations needed more than ever. So, and, and look at it also from a, a, an innovation within the labs uh, mindset as well. I mean, a lot of our faculty went into, okay, I'll halt this project over here but what can I do right now for cur current need on the market, for current need when it comes to healthcare, environment, um, workforce now is really what we're looking at because we're, I mean, the unemployment rate is severe. And so we're trying to figure out how to tackle that problem as well. But um, I, it, it, as innovators, we were just pivoted to current need situations and current need projects. Right. Um, and, you know, some big themes that I'm hearing and everything that you're saying is, you know, A, problem solving, um, and B, just kind of, you know, adapting and collaborating to kind of work together, um, you know, just 
pull a bunch of resources to in some sort of unified effort to, you know, combat what's going on right now. Um, and you know, this, you know, the, the, what I keep hearing over and over is just, you know, the situation is changing and you just have to adapt to, to meet it. Um, you know, so thank you for doing all this work, um, you know, with the N95 masks and kind of supporting our, our healthcare system in response. Um, Leslie, do you have, uh, you know, can you share a little bit more about your experience with kind of adapting to the ongoing situation? Yeah, I mean, I think if anything, the pandemic has taught us that we need the grace and the skills to know how to pivot and to be able to be nimble and to be able to go with the flow and and what that looks like and how to do that successfully. And so, so much of of what the Well Institute has been a part is, you know, we are a startup in ourselves. We were just announced in the fall. We, you know, if you will, had like a soft launch in the spring. I joined in mid-February, so I was actually only on campus five weeks before everything shut down. And so if you think about it, you know, so much of the foundation has been built virtually and also trying to understand not only what students want the Well Institute to be, but what they need for it to be and to get that buy-in and, and create that space to um, know how we're going to approach and tackle the fall in a way that's going to, you know, stick stick to our mission and really teach the beauty of failure because I think failure is so necessary and I don't want anyone to think about you know pre-COVID and post-COVID and think that there's failure you know in between from what could have been but instead to see that as opportunity and so if we think about it in that optimistic mind frame you know we just made the call yesterday for a brilliant beautiful grand scale women's summit that's scheduled for November 17th to be 100% virtual but honestly like i am okay with that and the reason i'm okay is because it equals more accessibility and more access for not just ut students but for you know female founders or or anyone who wants to receive the content from that summit to experience it you know on their own schedule on their own time from the comfort of their own home which is you know obviously how this world is feeling right now but i do think that there's such opportunity to be able to have scalability with the pandemic so if i think about it with like this women's summit and what we're trying to do with that i think you know there's the optimism in that and and then the reach that that's able to have and obviously as i mentioned the accessibility i do think um yeah i think it's 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 coming up with a toolkit, if you will, those equipping skills to be able to handle something like this. And it's not a new normal, it's the next normal and just getting our minds around that and how to um, have healthy mindset to, to move forward. Right. Um, and I think that's very powerful. Um, you know, how you mentioned the kind of push for more accessibility. Um, and, you know, I feel like we've kind of taken, you know, in-person collaboration uh, for granted while we had it, but, you know, given our situation now, uh, I like how you say it's not the new normal, it's the next normal. Um, and, you know, that push for accessibility, I think, is is something that can't be emphasized enough. Um, and, you know, this is a, you know, a beautiful segue into our next question. Um, you guys both talked about, you know, innovation and kind of adapting. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys, you know, is innovation something that you believe is, um, you know, driven by necessity? Is it driven by freedom? Um, is it something that's a science or is it something that's, you know, perspective and creativity? Um, you know, you guys have a bunch of experience, so I just want to hear your opinion on, you know, what is the, what are some of the drivers of innovation? Well, I've, I've had a background leading an accelerator for social impact and green startups, so environmentally focused startups. And so I've seen um, a lot of startups pitch. I've seen a lot of interactions with potential investors. I've seen kind of what's stuck. I've seen um, who's been successful and, 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 and who has been successful in realizing that maybe their venture isn't going to be a success, which, you know, I think that there's importance to make note of that too. But, um, you know, for me, innovation really comes from the why. And I feel like founders and ideas that are centered and anchored to their why is the most important thing. And so um, when I think about that, there's there's a quote I actually saw recently from Simon Sinek who wrote, start with your why. And that is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. And I feel like if you can take it down to the why, that's when you can be the most innovative because that's where you're most authentic and where you're coming from the best place. So it's it's a simple answer, but honestly, I think it all comes from knowing and staying true to that why and having that be your north star throughout 
the entire, you know, entrepreneurial process. Yeah. Protect I, that. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, always questioning and kind of just prodding and just kind of diving deeper into understanding why you're doing something, um, you know, is really important and it kind of always helps to guide you in the right direction. Um, so I'd love to hear, uh, you know, Miss Jennings' opinions on this as well. Well, Les, you came with a great quote. I don't have a, an inspirational quote like that, but I, I do um, believe that innovation is both art and science. Absolutely. It's both. It's, it, it takes the creatives, it takes the scientists, it takes the researchers. I also think it's driven through need and prob a problem. Um, if it's driven through freedom, then there has to be specific um, motivation around innovating. And if you look at how some of the top con companies in, in the world run their R&D departments, right, or, or run their in-house innovation teams, everyone does it to their own kind of different flavor and, and recipe, if you will. Um, but I truly believe it, it absolutely starts with your why and at the core, um, something that you have to so deeply want to solve that you leave behind all the other tabs in your head that might be open to close those and to focus on that one tab as an entrepreneur. I mean, I know um, specifically, and like Leslie, I have a background in uh, helping run accelerators and studying, studying accelerator models. And um, then the why for helping start one of our first diversity focused accelerators in the country was behind walking into a co-working space where I was running my own company at the time and I was looking around and I didn't see many people who looked like me. And I was also looking for women mentors and advisors and I noticed that a lack thereof and I just thought, where are my ladies at? And then I started studying and, you know, looking at where um, the VC funding was going for women owned businesses, like where are the pockets of the country who are doing it a little bit better or more focused on that than where we were currently five to six years ago here in Austin and in looking around and identifying a problem uh, that led me to wanting to solve the problem, even if it meant bootstrapping two startup companies at the same time and, um, you know, driving Lyft in the morning to, to fundraise and um, just really hitting the ground and meeting as many people as I could and networking out the wazoo. Um, I think it starts with your why, with the problem, what you're wanting to solve, but I absolutely believe innovation stems from it's both science and art at the same time right um you know thank you thank you for sharing that both of your responses uh very inspiring for our audience here um and you know i kind of like how you said you know you need to kind of close down all your other tabs and, and kind of make this your your main focus um and you know the, the asking the why over and over um you know i i feel like it really provides clarity um you know if you keep asking that question so thank you for sharing that with our group. Uh, you know, a very powerful message. Um, so moving on to our next question, you know, I mentioned that both of you guys um, have been very avid advocates for, you know, gender equality, um, you know, in the workforce and entrepreneurship and just in general. Um, and unfortunately, it's taken us, you know, this long to come to our senses and realize that, you know, women have a lot to offer. Um, but on the flip side, you know, it's good that it's happening now. Um, and it's also in the hands of our, you know, Gen Z to kind of push that progress and make sure that, you know, it stays and it's not there to go. So, you know, how, you know, as the leaders of tomorrow um, in our youth generation, can we ensure gender equality um, and support women in entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, so I've done actually a lot of research on, on this. I worked with the Chanel Foundation to do a report on power, her, and tech. And one thing came really clear from that, and also there's a lot of focus and, and research on this, which is great because that means that, you know, it's a topic that needs focus and research and um, next steps and check boxes. But um, it's, it, so, so the, the data point that sticks out, especially today in 2020, is that while 79% of women entrepreneurs in the U.S. feel more empowered than they did five years ago, 66% of them still have trouble securing funding. And another thing that's interesting from that stat is that if a woman is funded at the same level as a, a male entrepreneur, they are just as likely to have a successful exit as their male counterpart. And so funding is really the big issue. And I think that 
you know, obviously there's now c coming up with, you know, female founded VCs and funding sources specifically centered around female and underrepresented um, founders. I th think that that's great and that's headed all in the right direction. Um, I think one thing that, that at least for ISIT and especially with the Well Institute and the importance around supporting our female founders, you know, so many people think that the answer is mentorship or coaching. And honestly, I think it's more in cheerleading and finding a cheerleading squad. And that might sound cheesy, but I think that we all just need to amplify what each other is doing and support that where we can. And I think that there's such great karma in sharing networks and resources and thinking about other people versus yourself when you're meeting with, you know, cool, awesome, um, you know, connections that you're making along the way. And so I think that that's something really tangible and it's something, you know, as, as y'all, you know, the next generation of leaders or those that are leading today, you know, I think that, you know, funding is something that's definitely being addressed outside of a university setting with these great female owned VCs and angel, angel networks and all that good stuff. But I would just um, really want to put out to this group that empowered women empower women. And we also need male allyship. And so I think that those are kind of like the key takeaways if you if you can support and share, you know, the good news or market or retweet as much as you can. That representation is huge. Um, and the celebrate celebrate excuse me, representation is huge and the celebration is, you know, just as big. And I think that that's so practical. I mean, I, I really think that that's something that y'all could, you know, begin doing right now for your friends and your family and your favorite brands and, you know, and products that you do love. Right. Um, and I think your response kind of touches really well on this idea of, you know, having a support system. Um, and, you know, I feel like with everything going on recently, um, you know, it's really been shown that activism is, is a really important part of driving change. And, you know, if we all as youth can play our part in being active supporters and kind of advocating for these changes, you know, in funding um, and just in support in general for women entrepreneurs, it'll be, uh, you know, very good for society as a whole. So thank you for sharing that as well as that insightful stat, Leslie. Um, Ms. Jennings, do you have anything uh, you would like to share? Yeah, I mean, I I um I have always and love supporting women business owners, and it stems from this deep passion to honestly move the needle uh, based around my first job, which was in a, a network newsroom where um, I was definitely a minority and on the field production team side of things, and it was somewhat of a if you will good old boys club. But learning from that, you know, funding for female founders has increased. Um, a little bit, but only 2.7%. So we're seeing the needle move slowly every year, especially since this conversation really started a good five to six years ago. And I now sway between, you know, advocacy is so important and activism so important. And we're in this incredibly pivotal time in history right now where social justice issues are at the forefront. It's so important to continue those conversations. And um, while you're continuing being a megaphone and being an activist, how can you also um, become one of those women who will be funding in the other women down the road, right? I, I for so long, was kind of um, very much about being uh, this megaphone, not realizing that I was taking away from time that I could have my heads down, grinding and hustling and saving and learning and figuring out how in the next 10 years I can have my own small angel check to write for that next woman business owner. And so I think it's so important also as we um, continue the activism and continue the conversation, not lose sight of creating and all the awesome role models ahead of us, but being one of those role models one day. And I think that this generation, I'm just constantly in awe of everything that you're doing. I mean, the you're leading the forefront of these conversations. You're bringing them um, historically to a moment of extreme change that's needed and impact that's needed. And so I only see huge bright futures for the activism to continue, but also for, um, like Leslie said, it's the funding. It's the lack of access to capital. It's the lack of access to resources in specific areas um, and knowing how to find that capital. And so I think 
as much, I've learned so much from, and I spent the morning actually um, in conversation with one of my dear mentors of five years. Um, and now seeing how much she's helped me in the last five years, getting closer to that step of being one of those potential funders for a woman entrepreneur down the road has just been incredibly full circle, but also on the male allyship side of things. Absolutely. And I see some of my uh, guy friends who are on watching this right now and who have always supported me. I'm so thankful for you, but that's a, you know, we have, we need everyone at the table, every single person at the table to have this conversation so that inherently when um, an entrepreneur residence program is rolled out, it's not just, oh shoot, look, there are eight to 10 just male faces, 50 to 60 year old, you know, on the block of the photo it's inherently built into where you're recruiting diversity of thought and you're recruiting diversity of voice and you're actively seeking out that diversity of talent and knowing that it's going to affect whether it's the mentor program, the bottom line of your company, a more diverse team, a more diverse network pool leads to better results. And I think um, we're, we're slowly moving the needle. We're getting there, but we still have a long way to go. Right. And I want to give, I want to just um, give a quick example, like male allyship, and this will be a topic that we definitely do in a workshop um, sponsored by the Well Institute. But, you know, example of this is, is having women representation and, and, you know, have full representation on panels and no more manals. I don't know if y'all have heard that. I just heard that kind of for the first time. But another thing is, you know, mansplaining is a, a real thing. And I see this and a man who can stop and said, well, that's what Leslie just said, or that's what Ashley just said, or to even call it out and said, excuse me, Ashley, you were interrupted. Please continue your thought. Those are small things that mean the world to the person that, um, you know, those actions are happening to. And it's funny because I feel like I'm a pretty confident person, but I have more confidence in supporting and, and, and advocating for other people than I do for myself. So when someone advocates for me, it's, it's huge. And so I try to return that favor and people notice and, and, and people will take note that it's, it's not, you know, we're, we don't live in that day and age anymore where you, you can get away with it. And, you know, that's not just, you know, gender inequality. It's, it's all inequality. And so we all just need to, to be vocal because I also think in this day and age, one thing that we've learned, you know, ex especially around racial injustice is that silence is louder and so we all need to have a response. No response is a really loud response. And so silence is just, it's, it's not acceptable anymore. All right. Um, and thank you both for sharing your responses to this. You know, this is a very um, you know, important conversation that should be happening on a global scale. Um, and we're really glad that you know, our audience can, can hear what you guys have to say. Um, and, you, and you guys both touched on you know, how there's a lot of difference we can make and it's either the small things or the big things. Um, and Leslie, you mentioned the small things. Um, and I thought Ms. Jennings, what you mentioned um, about, you know, thinking long-term about, you know, how you can be a mentor um, and kind of switching the, switching the roles um, was also very insightful. So um, let's go into our next question here. Um, and that is, you know, what are some exciting things that you're seeing um, you know, in the Austin entrepreneurship ecosystem, uh, as well as the tech ecosystem, you know, there's a lot of talk about how Texas is going to be the new California um, with a lot of tech companies, as well as just, you know, corporate talent just coming here. Um, so can you guys talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the exciting things you see um, in Austin and, and what direction you see, you know, the city and the ecosystem moving towards? Um, from a city perspective and again i've been pretty heads down on these response projects but specifically in this epidemiological lab and but on the city perspective i have been sitting in and out of the um a task force over at austin chamber is their innovation task force and they're pulling in leaders from across the ecosystem co-working spaces and accelerators and startup founders and everyone's really rallying, which is wonderful. The city of Austin's talking to the chamber, who's talking to the university, the university's talking to the city. And so um, I, I think it's, it's incredible to watch the all hands on deck mentality of getting us through the next six months of, of what we're in right now. But I know from a, a technology standpoint, I have friends who specifically 
are event planners, right? And their entire livelihood um, has been and how they throw the most experiential in-person event. Now we're having to completely rethink models around event planning, which I know Leslie will probably talk to a little bit too, because we're all thinking through programmatically, but events in virtual, the, the new actual virtual reality we live in, live in. And I think as we utilize technology to figure out what the future of the workforce looks like, I mean, the future of the workforce might very well, a large percentage, percentage of it stay online in this, in this virtual world that we are, this digital world that we live in. Um, some exciting things that I'm watching um, outside of, I guess, COVID projects uh, related to the, specifically to the pandemic on the healthcare and uh, economical side, I'm seeing some interesting stuff being developed on robotics, um, exoskeletons coming out of the university uh, specifically to uh, be utilized in various uh, field needs for our armed forces members. I'm seeing some really cool technology around that. Um, how we're utilizing data and, and tracking data right now um, when it comes to on the pandemic and geolocating side of things and figuring out how to forecast what's coming in various cities and counties and states overall. Um, but I think data is changing a little bit because data scientists are teaming up with engineers or teaming up with the supercomputer people um, to figure out new methods of building out a toolkit for the next pandemic and making sure this doesn't happen again. Um, so we're, we're thinking forward focused and future focused on you know, what are some of the big problems coming down the pipeline? Not that we can think of what else could happen right now in this time in history, but really utilizing technology to be ready to go whenever that next big problem happens. Um, I think, you know, also we're seeing um, in terms of the ecosystem, co-working spaces and models and how those are going to play out. Co-working spaces fully rely on community, right? And if you've ever been able to go inside of one, um, it, a lot of it is based around the networking aspect and being around other innovators and that spirit and that energy. I mean, I say it all the time, but um, I, my first time walking into a co-working space, I got as excited going up to the 16th floor as I did walking to the train in New York every morning for my first uh, job in network news not really excited me and got my spark. I was really my spark in entrepreneurship was being in that energy. So I, it'll be interesting to see what happens to co-working space models and accelerators. Um, but I think the future of workforce is, has changed for good. And I mean, we also have had a lot of big city announcements lately with Tesla coming in and Austin is just an epicenter with all of our different campuses. And um, so just trying to keep up also um, for those in the audience, our students on, in the news and, and as you're looking at opportunities, keeping up with all the different technological opportunities coming in. Right. Um, you know, I, I like how you talked about kind of both spectrums of what's going on right now and also what we're preparing for. Um, and, you know, being proactive seems like a very big, you know, part of what's going on right now. Um, so let's let, um, you know, Leslie speak a little bit more about what she's seeing from her end. Yeah, I mean, I think if we if we think about Austin and, you know, I'm, I'm a newcomer to Austin as well. I've been here four and a half years and gosh, the city has changed so much even since I've gotten here. So I can only imagine, you know, what it will look like and feel like in four and a half years. But, but what I know is that Austin is accessible and it's approachable and it truly is good karma in terms of sharing network and sharing connections. And if there's one thing I've learned is that you know, we need to protect that. There's, there's something about building network, but in Austin, it's about building community. And I think that that's something that we really need to protect because if somebody makes an introduction, you know, most likely I will say the person that's, that's being introduced will hear back because there is that, that, that vibe that exists here and that authenticity to really, you know, to, to share the wealth of what we've, what we've created and built in Austin. And so I hope that doesn't change. And I think that that's what makes Austin so unique. And especially in the startup ecosystem, I mean, it's very collaborative and everyone is, you know, sharing the good graces of the resources that they have or the connections that they have. And I don't want that to stop and it should never stop. And so, so please, you know, return emails, return calls and, 
and and be part of you know what makes Austin so desirable right now I think for you know the startups that are coming from other places and especially from Silicon Valley we hear about this being Silicon Hills and I just you know I I, I really want to protect what what's been created here and then in terms of tech I mean I really do think that um, startups should, should focus at the very beginning about tech for good and it's something that was a platform I used to uh, stand on in terms of you know, working with social impact related startups, but thinking about tech as accessible. And again, going back to that, why thinking about impact. I mean, I know that it's a hot term right now, impact report and impact numbers, but it is important because, you know, dollars are based off of what it is that you can, you can prove like technologically, but also what is the good behind that? And I think that if you can stand on that, you're gonna get more buy-in because you've thought through the, the big picture. And again, your why is gonna speak louder than anything else. And so it's just, I think, should be the trend in anything that you do or you know um, present or pitch is that you can't underemphasize you know, the tech for good piece of, of what it is that you're trying to build or what it is that's coming to the city. And I'm from Tulsa, so Tulsa put up a really good fight with, you know, Tesla for Tulsa and all of that great stuff. But um, again, you know, the opportunity is just coming so fast and furiously and it's great for Austin, but I do know that the culture here is kind of on a brink to change and y'all as, you know, the next generation and the, the future really will have a role to play in, in terms of which way that goes and, and you know, to, to protect what makes it so special here and delicious. I think Austin is delicious. <laughs> Austin has some great tacos. Right. That's a, that's a conversation for another day. Um, but, you know, thanks. Thank you for, you know, sharing, uh, you know, more about how tech can be used for good. Cause you know, us growing up, which has been a huge part of our lives and it kind of influences everything we do. And it's good to see that, you know, there's trajectory for to move to, you know, um, like more, I guess, like useful causes uh, in terms of COVID-19 response. Um, and also just, I think both of you guys talked about this, you know, Austin is really built on collaboration. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that changes moving forward. But, you know, I think that was a, that was a great exchange on the questions we had, and we'd like to open it up for Q and A. So if anyone is, um, interested in asking a question, you know, feel free to either type it in the chat or come off mute and ask a question. All right, I'll go first. Uh... What does, what did empowerment mean to you as a teenager and what does it mean to you now? And this is for both women. Wow. Um, <laughs> I can't think back that far. I feel like teenage years, that was, that was a while ago. I think probably um, I didn't have the maturity to, to look at the women around me and realize what it was that they had overcome or succeeded in just, you know, a generation, you know, to look at the progress from my grandmother to my mother to me and now what I want to pass on to my daughter. Um, I have a three-year-old and I think really to like cherish the journey of the women that came before you. I wish I would have had that hindsight to realize that even though um, it's slow and that noodle, that needle's not moving as fast as anyone would like for it to. Um, we've got to have the grace and the recognition to realize those that have come before us and the journeys that got us to where we are here today. So empowerment to me is I think just giving, um, you know, due diligence and recognition to those who have paved the way for others. And again, back to that empowered women, empower women. Like I truly do believe that. Great question. Um, I agree. I think it's about uh, cheerleading each other and, and championing each other. I, th I think I also, through my journey in learning what my own empowerment feels like, have realized my own privilege in where I sit. And I've learned to check that privilege at the door and know that there uh, are a million other things that um, I need to go help and focus on because I sit in a very specific special place and I need to pour out time and energy into fixing some of our biggest problems because of where I sit, even though, um, you know, we are talking about disparagement of women in the workforce and whatnot, but it's, I recognize even in the seats that I've had, how lucky I am to be at those tables. And so it, empowerment for me now 
um, realizes and looks around and thinks, how do I grab another sister to be at the table, right? And how do I make sure that I'm pulling along and helping um, rising tides, you know, helping build a ship that's rising tides, all boats, but all, specifically boats where my sisters are at, right? And um, so I think empowerment for me, when I was a teenager, it was focused on individuality and making sure I was just blinders on, heads down, how do I get to the next milestone? How do I, um, you know, hit the next big goal that I'm trying to achieve, bring that vision to fruition? Now it's more so I sit and I um, think about how I can spread that wealth and where I'm already at now. And it's not just blinders on, just me. How do I power forward in this race of life? It's how do I power forward with those around me and pull them along with me? Um, I have two nieces who are my everything. And I think all the time about uh, you know the world that they're growing up in right now and how I can leave it as a better place for when they're they're my age. It's a great question and actually um, it's one I asked you know a group of stakeholders on UT's campus like what does empowerment mean to you and we did a word cloud and it, you know it bubbled up and it was visual but um, you know consensus was that empowerment equals independence. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not able to see the chat. So if there's a question in there, um, feel free to, to read it out. Or if anyone wants to ask another question, um, go ahead. Now's the time. I think uh, Anjali has a question. She said, how do you encourage positivity while discouraging negativity no matter where you are? I find it to be difficult for many people at times. That, that's a great question. And I, the first thing that comes to mind is I used to be extremely reactive in conversation, especially if there was some sort of negative negativity, uh, negative statement, negative spirit around me, negative energy. Um, I used to be reactive to it and feel like I had to um, say something and talk to it and automatically uh, respond to it. But now I've learned in discouraging negativity and encouraging positivity, sometimes it's really okay just to sit and think about what you're going to say and listen also before you are reactive because that's the best way to help um, whatever the negative spirit or negativity going on around you um, to disperse it and deflect it immediately is sometimes just to, I, I used to talk a lot and now I, I listen a lot more. And I think that's one way to kind of discourage negativity and encourage positivity through your actions. Yeah, it's, it's a definitely a, a great question. And, you know, it's hard being positive right now. And I actually, you know, before joining the Kendra Scott Well Institute was really just such a super fan of Kendra. And the reason was that she was so positive, so approachable. Everything was like high energy. And it was, it was attractive and it was something that I wanted to surround myself with and not just Kendra, but other women like that, that positivity is really infectious. But um, one thing I would say on that is when I catch myself being negative or hear other people being negative, the mantra that I've created for myself, especially now in COVID is thankful and grateful, thankful and grateful. And it's centering. It really is centering. And so when people ask me how I am, I'll say I'm thankful and grateful. And then however they react to that, you know, kind of then leads the conversation. But if I, you know, would have been negative, it, it's, it's just a, a much better, more honest place, I think, to lead from. And, and I think it's okay to, to, to be authentic and to say what's really going on and to not Pollyanna it and to, to be true with, with how you're feeling, because then I think that makes you real and relatable and authentic. And, you know, it, it, it's important right now to have that transparency. So I think if you can come up with a mantra and mind thankful and grateful to just recenter you, I think that that's, that would be key. Great. Thanks for those great questions, guys. Um, as well as those responses. Uh, we have Kanish who just asked a question. He says, how can male allies help to empower women in their workplace or organization? Yeah, pull up a chair to the table. Invite your 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 
anyone, invite anyone that looks different from you to the table. But especially in terms of women, you know, it's allowing the space, creating the space. I shouldn't say allowing, it's creating the space for them to have a voice. And I think, you know, Meghan Markle actually had something that really spoke to me so loudly. It was a quote that it's, you know, women don't need to find their voice. They've always had their voice. It's just, they need a place to be able to speak it and feel comfortable doing that. And so, you know, everyone's job is to create those comfortable spaces. And I love getting uncomfortable and rolling around in new places and in the dirt and feeling, you know, a little bit out of my element, but you also have to understand that, you know, it's, it's inclusivity and it's making sure that you're, yeah, you're, you're respecting those who, so actually I, I'm going to change it. It's respecting those who are at the table, but it's also looking around the table and being very intentional about realizing who's not there. Like actually saying who is not at this table who needs to be there. And that is, I think, then where the real work happens. And that should always be the first question in anything that you do is who's not at the table. And then create them a throne with sparkles. Everything that Leslie said and more and um, absolutely in terms of allyship, it is in, like automatically noticing that it's only six men across the table from you and realizing, oh, maybe we should invite that other voice and that other uh, talent to the table. Right, um, and I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, but I just wanna say thank you once again to uh, Leslie as well as Ms. Jennings for joining us in this conversation about, you know, how we can all play our part in, um, you know, just innovation as well as just supporting women in entrepreneurship and in the workforce and just generally in society. Um, it's a very important conversation, and I'm really glad that we had some great insights um, and, you know, and just a great conversation with you two. So if anyone, if anyone just wants to say thanks or something, just come off their mic, um, and we'll be wrapping it up real soon. Cheers. I put my LinkedIn. Please, you know, connect with me. And if I know someone that you want to know, send me a message, and I'll try to make that happen for you. Thank and you. Mean it. Absolutely. I'm going to put my email in here as well. If you'd um, like to connect over an office hour, probably after July 22nd, but. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys. We really appreciate it here. Thank you.